Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure update. It's the 30th of May. Quite a few updates this week. I think they forgot about a few from build last week. So as always, you can jump to a particular update you care about the most. New videos this week. One of the big announcements of build was NL Web. So I thought I'd do a video just explaining pretty quickly what NL Web does, what challenges it's solving, and then how you can look to use it. And then a pretty big announcement for Entra ID and its internet access capability. It now has TLS inspection. So nearly all internet traffic is encrypted. Well, now as an organization, I can still view most types of traffic. So I can do full path, for example, categorization and add in other plugins like data loss prevention and threat protection, etc. even when it is TLS encrypted. So on to what's new. On the compute side, so the App Service Hybrid Connection Manager, some of the updates has gone GA. So this enables App Service to talk to resources in any network. So there's a relay agent that is placed in the target network and it now works for Windows and Linux clients. It has better logging, it has a new GUI and a new CLI experience. On the networking side, so private subnet has gone GA. So today by default, resources in a subnet get this implicit IP address that enables them to talk to the internet. Now, that's going away 30th of September, 30th of September 2025. And so you'll have to do an deliberate method. You'll have to have some explicit internet access method like a NAT gateway, or it's behind an Azure load balance that has a public IP, or you give it a public IP or firewall. You'd have to do something. What private subnet does is when I set this on my subnet, it will stop that implicit public IP. So I'd have to do something explicit or it won't have any access out to the internet that live in that particular subnet. Azure Firewall DNAT on private IPs has gone GA. So basically that's destination network address translation. So if I have, for example, uh, an overlapping IP address range situation on my internal network, because DNET transforms that destination IP and or port, and then reverses any responses, it can solve when I have some IP challenges. So now even on the private IP addresses of Azure Firewall, it's gonna do that DNET uh, configuration for you. App Gateway SSE is now in preview. So this is server-side events. Now remember, App Gateway is our layer seven application regional load balancer. And with server sent events, I can do things like real-time streaming from a server to multiple clients. Think of it, I have a persistent HTTP connection and then the server can now push to the client over that persistent connection. So think about I have a dashboard or notifications or some kind of live feed. Well, they would rely on those real-time type updates. So now the server could go ahead and push those to the client. Azure Front Door now supports container apps and functions as origins in GA. So this is for the... Um, premium SKU of Azure Front Door. But now if I have container apps or functions that are using private link, so the way you talk to them is via an IP address on your virtual network, I can now still use those as origins for my Azure Front Door Premium, which would now make Azure Front Door the only way of going and consuming those particular instances of the service. And also, speaking of the origins, so Azure Front Door can now use managed identity to go and talk to those origins in preview for both the standard and premium SKUs. API management, remember API management is that runtime capability for how we want to, yes, find APIs, but also we talk via the management gateways to go and consume the APIs. Well, now it has session aware load balancing in GA. So that's gonna be really useful because what it now means is any requests that are coming from the same session will get routed to the same backend instance. And that's obviously gonna be really important if the backend is maintaining some kind of ongoing state. So I have to keep talking to the same one. Things like the OpenAI Assistance API, the Batch API, they maintain state. So I'd always wanna go and talk to the same instance when I'm going via APIM. APIM also now has LLM logging in GA. So that's kind of a big deal when I think about observability and then insight into what's happening. So I can capture and store the large language model prompts, i.e. the input, 
the completions when I get back, token usage metrics for all of the large language model traffic via APIM. I do this via diagnostic settings, which means I can send it to all the regular storage account, event hub, log analytics, workspace, or Azure monitor logs. So all of those things are available. There are now metrics available at the workspace gateway level. So CPU and memory utilization percentages will show up now for all of the gateway units that make up a particular workspace gateway. Note, workspace gateway auto scaling has also gone GA. So that's gonna let the gateway units actually scale based on CPU memory utilization or on some defined schedule. APIM federated login has gone GA. This just lets me have a view of all of the logs across the entire APIM, APIM instance. Um, for example, so the APIM platform team, they may want to see logs for the entire instance, whereas teams would still want to see the logs only for their specific APIs. So this is going to be useful for that platform team when they want that larger scoped view, maybe for security purposes to see what's happening or for just broader insights into the APIs that are being used. An APIM can now directly import from Foundry in GA. So I create my model endpoints in my Azure AI Foundry and I can just now directly import them into my APIM AI gateway. So it's just much, much easier to onboard. And of course, once it's onboarded to APIM, then I can apply my APIM policies to help maybe um, throttle things, check token use, et cetera, et cetera. APIM standard V2 now has private endpoint support gone GA. So I can have private endpoints to talk to my APIM instance. So I can have a complete end-to-end -end private solution now if I want to. And APIM applications is in preview. So think of this as a better way to handle the OAuth, so the authorization-based access to your APIs. I can now enable my particular API product in APIM for application-based access. And what that will mean is now it will use Entra authentication. So only a client application that can obtain an OAuth token from Entra, which means it is authenticated and been authorized, gone through conditional access by Entra, will now be able to talk to the API. APIM Premium V2 tier is in preview. So this is an architectural change. It separates the management traffic from the regular data plane. So I no longer have to worry about connectivity needed for the management operations. Um, it has unlimited calls, very high other limits. So it can really, the goal here is to meet the largest scale API requirements. And APIM now supports AWS Bedrock uh, APIs in preview. And of course, once I've onboarded my AWS Bedrock model endpoint, so that's the AWS service for running foundational models like language models, multimodal, et cetera, et cetera, well, now I can apply my APIM policies to it. So those token limit policies, those metric policies, semantic caching, I'd be able to use all of those. So if I think about multi-cloud, this is a really big deal that APIM can still be used even if my model is not in Azure. On the storage side, so Azure NetApp Files now supports managed HSM for customer managed keys, that's in GA. So think about the volume encryption where I want to have the key stored in my key vault, well a managed HSM is a level up in the security. It's FIPS 140-2 level three instead of level two. So that might be required for certain deployments, certain industries where I have regulatory requirements. Well, now I can use that with Azure NetApp files. Premium SSD V2 and Ultra Disk, when connected using NVMe protocol instead of SCSI, now support live resize in preview. Remember, Premium SSD V2 and Ultra Disk are really cut from the same cloth. They both have dynamic IOPS and throughput. I, I can change them dynamically separate from the capacity, Ultra just has a slightly lower latency and higher possible performance. So now when I am using that NVMe connectivity, which is available for most of the newer VM SKUs, and I've selected a support in OS image that uses NVMe, I can now dynamically increase the size of that disk. Now I can't shrink them. I've never been able to shrink an Azure managed disk, but now I could increase the size. Obviously once I increase it, 
I would now have to go in and increase the size of the volume in the OS. But I don't have to shut down the VM. I don't have to disconnect it from the VM or anything like that. And Elastic SAN now has Azure backup support in preview. So Elastic SAN gives me that Microsoft native solution that's built directly on the Azure storage stack. It's an iSCSI based solution. iSCSI works over the network connections. So I can use it from anything, but it's really useful where I want maybe some kind of shared connection at a block level to something like clusters use this a lot. So solutions like Azure VMware Solution, Azure Container Storage and more all utilize Elastic SAN. Well, now I can back up that Elastic SAN and its volumes using Azure Backup. I think it's every 24 hours and I can have up to 450 restore points, but it gives me that extra security um, for my data. On the database side, I'm sure I've talked about this before, but PostgreSQL versionless custom managed key is now GA. So what this means is I have the key in my key vault. I don't have to pick a specific version. I just say this key. And then whenever that key gets rotated to a newer version, PostgreSQL will automatically pick it up and start using it. So it takes away actions on me that I have to perform on the database. And obviously I could combine that with things like Azure Key Vault auto key rotation. So it's just completely seamless. I never have to manually do anything. Uh, the Cosmos DB JavaScript SDK 4.0 has gone GA. So this is where I want to build my applications in JavaScript against Cosmos DB NoSQL API. So there are a number of key improvements. It has better bulk operation support. It has client-side encryption support, built-in vector and full-text search support. So obviously the vector stuff is huge when I think of semantic meaning and large language models. It has better diagnostic logging, more flexible and scalable query design. So hey, probably going to want to go and use that with my JavaScript. Um, Cosmos DB MongoDB vCore now has change stream. So the whole point of this with the chain stream is I can just basically subscribe to this chain stream and then I will get notified of the changes in real time. So it removes the need for me as an application to have to go and poll saying, hey, do you have any changes? There's that hammer polling, any changes, any changes, any changes. I can enable, disable it using the Azure CLI, ARM templates with the portal coming soon. And Cosmos DB MongoDB also now has function triggers and bindings in preview. So I could trigger that serverless Azure function when a change occurs in my MongoDB vCore. So think about, hey, some real time change is happening. And in that real time, I want to go and trigger this code to run. And I can also bind to do further types of uh, updates, changes to my database. And then Document DP now has a Docker image in preview. So basically, just lets me run the document db locally on my machine so it makes it easier to test things out uh, before i maybe go and consume it in the cloud for example miscellaneous so api center now has a free tier in preview remember api center is more that development time so apim is more the runtime i'm talking through it api center is that inventory that discovery that management hub of any api i'm using and actually mcp serves as well used by my organization. So there was previously a 90 day free trial, but now it's just a free tier. Now obviously it's free. So I think it's 200 APIs that supported five versions of an API, which is a lot less than the standard plan. But check out the docs and it goes through all of those full limits. And talking of uh, API Center, so both API Center and API Management now have MCP support in preview. Obviously, MCP is huge. It's the way that AI applications can, in a standard way, talk to knowledge and tools, and then also explain them to the large language model, which can then ask the AI app to call something, and it's all basically done via MCP. So this includes APIM being able to enforce authentication, authorization, rate limiting, and more, plus exposing any API as an MCP server. An API center can act as a private remote MCP registry for your organization. Uh, Azure Migrate now has ultra disk support in preview. So it basically just means that highest performance, lowest latency disk 
Well, Azure Migrate will now be able to, when it's assessing your workload, it will consider the ultra disk capabilities and potentially suggest it as the target when I'm migrating my data disks. And on the same basically topic, premium SSD v2 support is now GA. So that exactly the same thing, just has a slightly higher latency, slightly lower top end IOPS and throughput. But Azure Migrate will now suggest that again, if it's the best possibility. And both of these are really good for those high performance databases, SAB HANA, um, things like that. Azure Migrate now has app awareness in preview. Now it's actually private preview right now, but what it lets me do is focus on the application instead of the server or database. And it's really focused on the re-host and re-platform scenarios. So what it lets you do is identify and tag dependent resources that make up an application, and then Azure Migrate will group them together into a wave to ensure they migrate together. The tooling will evaluate all of them collectively, and I get a whole new user experience accompanying this. Microsoft Planetary Computer Pro is in preview. I thought this was some kind of super team originally, but no, it's a geospatial data platform, i.e. you ingest geospatial a locational data sets, and this then enables me to work and act on that location-based data. Um, the OpenAI SOAR model is now available in Azure AI Foundry. So SOAR is the thing that can generate those cool videos you see. So I can now use it in the new video playground and also via the API. Now, if I use the video playground, I deploy a Sora model and I can play around with it. It'll actually let me view code so I could then recreate what I'm doing via the video playground easier in the API. And then Foundry Content Filtering Spotlighting has gone GA. So remember content filters help apply protection for anything that's talking to my model that comes out of the model. And a big part of that is prompt shields that look for either direct, are you doing something malicious in the prompt, or indirect, I'm referring to some document, I'm referring to some website that's sneaking in some commands. Well, spotlighting is a sub-feature of prompt shields. And what it lets me do is tag documents that are gonna be added as part of the input to the large language model as lower trust. So the model now knows to trust it less than the regular user and the system prompts. So that's gonna help prevent the model performing unintended actions that are embedded within the document that are gonna try and indirectly attack the model. And that was it. As always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.